Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenters are Dr. Russell Nord and Michael Armande. Dr. Nord is a fellowship-trained orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine. He treats a variety of conditions in both the athlete and the non-athlete. Dr. Nord completed his sports medicine fellowship at Stanford University where he took care of Stanford athletes and served as the team physician for the Stanford football team. He also provided orthopedic care for the San Francisco 49ers. Prior to joining Stanford, Dr. Nord completed his orthopedic surgery residency at NYU Hospital for Joint Disease in New York City, where he was selected Executive Chief Resident during his final year. Dr. Nord received his Doctorate of Medicine at Cornell University and completed his undergraduate work at Duke University. Dr. Nord currently serves as the Medical Director for Washington Sports Medicine. Michael graduated with his Bachelor's of Science degree in Kinesiology at San Diego State University. In May of 2015, Michael earned his Doctorate of Physical Therapy at California State University, Fresno. He continues to develop his manual therapy skills at the clinic and through continuing education courses, including certification in rock tape functional movement techniques. Born at Washington Hospital and raised in Newark, California, Michael is eager to provide quality orthopedic physical therapy to the community he grew up in. All right, thank you for that kind introduction, Lucy. Thank you all for coming. So we have, a, I think, a very interesting and relevant topic today. The title is Prevention of Injury in Youth and Adolescent Sports. Some of you may have heard that this is a topic that's coming up in the media these days. It's certainly one of the hot button issues. There are questions about whether injury rates in our youngsters doing athletics are rising suspicion that there, there is in fact a rise in this and questions coming up as to why this is and what we can do about it. And that's going to be the focus of our talk today. Now while Lucy gave a wonderful introduction of me as a professional, this talk actually is going to draw on more than just orthopedic surgery. It's going to draw on topics such as sociology, psychology, economics. We're going to touch on issues of family values and what's important. So my perspective today as your speaker isn't just as an orthopedic surgeon. I'll also be speaking to you as the father of four young children some of which are old enough to play organized sports. I see one of their teams here, where I'm uh, one of the youth soccer coaches, so I speak to you as a coach as well. I'm also a, a, an avid sports fan. And when I was young, I was a, a youth athlete, and that's an important perspective to bring to this talk as well. And I'm actually gonna start the talk by referencing that and speaking about how things were and how things really have become when it comes to competitive youth sports. So back when I was a little kid growing up in New Jersey, in East Brunswick, which is and it's still a big soccer town actually. Competitive soccer really started around age eight. And that's when we had something called a, a travel team where you get you know, kids together on one team from the town, you'd go around and play the other towns in the area. And although it was as competitive as things got, it was still relatively relaxed, different from the way things are today. Our coach was just a dad of a player. He never played soccer himself, but he tried his best, tried to learn and really cared about the whole student athlete. We'd have to bring our report cards to practices whenever we got them. He'd make sure that we were doing all, all right in school, and he really had a very nurturing, supportive environment. We had, at the time, what we thought was an intensive practice schedule. We practiced two days a week, and we'd have a game every weekend, with the exception of the state cup season when we'd have two games. And we'd go to occasional tournaments in other states to play the teams from those states, which we couldn't play in our regular league play. And one of the key things is we played all spring and all fall, but we never played in the summer. And we essentially never played in the winter either. In New Jersey, it's snowing, it's cold, you can't play soccer outside. And indoor space was expensive and hard to get. We hardly ever played indoor soccer. So we had time to rest. And as a result of this, I think, we, we had a very healthy 
existence within sports. The only injury that I could remember from my many years on the soccer team was when I actually broke my pinky and was out for a few games with that. But really, people were very, very healthy. But this really isn't the way competitive youth sports is scheduled nowadays. The future was different, but I got a glimpse of the future. I got a glimpse of the future way back in the late 80s. We played the future, basically, and the future was in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. It was the state semifinals, and we thought we were so good, and we were going to play Cherry Hill. And we knew there was going to be trouble as soon as we showed up, because on the back of their jackets, they had state champs listed, and below it was every year they'd had the state championships for people that age. So they'd never lost a game in all the state championships from age 8 on to when this was about 12 years old, 13 years old or so. They were different than us, and they shellacked us. They were from a, from a different league. They practiced Monday through Friday. Their players weren't just from one town. They were from all over the area, which is how things are now in these selective teams. And the kind of soccer they were playing was the kind of soccer that you had to be taught by a coach with some sort of legitimate soccer experience, almost a professional type coach. And that's what we see now as well. Coaches are often hired rather than volunteered. And there's no question this model clearly worked. Cherry Hill was not only the best team in New Jersey, they were one of the best teams in the whole country. And that's how this model, I think, has evolved. A lot of our youth teams that are competitive are now operating in a manner such as this. And it does work. It works in the short term in terms of getting success at the youth level. The questions we're going to be asking today is whether this really works in the long term and whether this is what we should be doing. Whether this sort of early sports specialization, we call it, putting all your sporting eggs in one basket, playing one sport you know, every day of the week at the expense of other sports, whether that's necessary and whether it's healthy and whether it's the way to really encourage success in sports in the later years or not. Those are the issues we'll be touching on. So we're talking about this today because we think there is an increase in youth sports injuries. And we need to understand that to understand how we might be able to reduce that risk. When we talk about injuries, all injuries aren't the same. There's basically two main categories of injuries, acute injuries and overuse injuries. We're going to define those and explain what leads to each and what can be done about them. Children and adolescents, they're different than adults. They're not just small adults. The anatomy is different. They have open growth plates. Their mechanics are different. We're going to touch on all that. And those facts have implications in terms of explaining why youngsters may be even more predisposed to certain overuse injuries than their adult counterparts. And like I said, we're not just going to stay in orthopedics and sports medicine. Today we're going to talk about some sociology, some questions about our society, and why are we having this current problem? What are the pressures in our society that leads to this? And in the end, of course, we're going to try to figure out how we can keep our athletes as safe as possible. As I already said, this is a topic some of you may have heard about in the news, in the media, etc. You see newspaper articles referencing the youth sports injury epidemic. You see that here. Just this week on NPR with Terry Gross, actually last week it was, they had a piece on overuse injuries specifically relating to uh, the pitcher's elbow. So this is something that's unavoidable in the media. And actually the discussion we're having now reminds me a little bit about what was going on with concussions five, six, seven years ago. It's kind of the beginning of that appreciation of an underlying problem. And I'm interested to see whether this gains traction and is something that we hear even more and more about as we're hearing more and more about the unavoidable issue with concussions these days in sports. So injuries unfortunately are a part of athletics. We just have to try to minimize it. And if kids are getting hurt in sports, the question is, should kids play sports at all? I certainly think the answer is yes. Sports are a wonderful activity. Children uh, participating in sports leads to improvements in confidence. It teaches children the importance of teamwork, how hard work pays off, and how preparation is critical to success. And they've even done scientific studies that show improved performance in schools when you compare the student athletes to the non-athlete students. In addition, we have an obesity epidemic in America today, and getting children involved in athletics and a healthy lifestyle early will help with their overall physical fitness for life. However, these are all great ideas, but when you ask a child, a young athlete, why they play sports, they don't mention any of those. They say it's fun. It's what they want to do. It's their favorite activity. I'm sure we all remember all the fun we had playing sports, and that's really the main reason it's so very important. So we just have to figure out how to do it safely. Certainly sports are popular. I probably don't need numbers to, to make this point. But in case you were questioning me, there's 7.34 million athletes playing high school sports in the U.S. alone. And if you cast an even wider net, there's 45 million U.S. children playing sports in organized athletics across the U.S. in any given year. These numbers are going up. About 10 years ago, there were only 5.2 million high school athletes. So we've got a couple million more now, just 10 years later. 
So with this many uh, youngsters playing sports, like I said, of course there are going to be some injuries. When we look at the numbers, there are about 3.5 million athletes under the age of 14 that require medical care each year for a sports-related injury. So these are injuries that are bad enough to warrant someone actually going to the doctor, but most of them are relatively mild, and most of them heal relatively quickly. However, some people think these injury rates are rising. I'm going to reference this gentleman here who's a very famous orthopedic surgeon that focuses on sports medicine. His name is Dr. James Andrews. He practices down in, in Alabama and Florida, but he's the team physician for the Washington Redskins and is very, very well known. And in his office, he's noted a five times increase in youth sports injuries since the new millennium in 2000. He's actually started a program in conjunction with some of the major sports medicine groups in the country to try to acknowledge this, better document what's going on regarding these injury rates, and put a stop to them to minimize youth sports injuries as best we can. Now, when we look at these injuries, about half of them are from overuse injuries and half of them are acute injuries. What do these terms mean? Well, let's start by defining them. An acute injury is easier to, to understand and appreciate and easier to describe, so we'll start with that. Acute injuries are ones that occur in a moment. You're fine one minute, but the next second, the next minute, you're injured. You twist your ankle one second. You were fine right before it, but after it, you're hurt. A bone gets broken. That happens in a flash. Now, we can't, we can't eliminate all acute injuries in sports, but by encouraging proper technique in athletic participation and having rules that mandate the proper technique being used, we can minimize them. The best example of this occurring we see here. This is the wrong way to tackle in football. This is called a spear tackle. And this, this is going to be a very, actually, a, a sad story for this young man. And what this person is doing, and this is, this is the way a lot of people used to tackle in football, was they would lead with their head. And it led to incredible amounts of force being brought down through the cervical spine. And what that led to were high rates of quadriplegia, paralysis, in high school and collegiate football. This was recognized, and the first step, of course, was taking the data, seeing what the numbers were, and noticing that there was a problem. Once we saw this, we said, let's take some action. Let's make this illegal. Let's stop teaching it. Let's start teaching that you tackle with your shoulder pads first, not your head first. And when we did that, we noticed that these numbers began to go down. They didn't go down to zero, but the rates of quadriplegia are now about a third of that, what they were before the rules were initiated here in the late 70s. And this young man on this specific play actually did sustain fractures in his cervical spine and unfortunately is represented here on this graph. So beyond rules modifications, there are other ways we can prevent acute injuries in sports. First thing is we need the appropriate equipment, such as a football helmet, and it has to be in good condition. It has to be fit and used properly. A football helmet that's not fit properly isn't going to do a good job. That applies to all sorts of protective equipment in sports. One of the issues that often comes up is bracing. Does bracing help? Does it not help? Is it worth it? Well, it, it's a question that has varied answers. For most types of bracing, there actually isn't any scientific evidence that really supports it or discredits it in terms of injury prevention. However, the two examples of where there are good pieces of evidence in terms of injury prevention for bracing have to do with high school basketball ankle sprains with this sort of brace. And that was a study done in the Midwest, and they did notice a decrease in high school basketball athletic sprains with the sorts of brace. However, that said, a lot of players don't like to play in the confinement of a brace. The trend these days is to go freer with the ankle. I'm seeing a lot of my basketball players wearing low top sneakers now, whereas just a few years ago they were in high tops. So there's a trade off in everything, and oftentimes there's a downside to bracing in terms of athletic performance. The other main piece of evidence that supports bracing in certain scenarios has to do with football, the linemen in football. Now this doesn't apply to youth sports so much because the braces are expensive and usually only available in the collegiate and pro levels, but these linemen will wear braces on their knees to prevent injuries to one of the ligaments in the knee called the MCL. So the football players are lined up tight together, someone will fall, there's no room to, to wiggle out of the way, they'll fall on the outside of a football player's knee and the inside will get injured as it gaps open. That's an MCL injury happening. And when you put these braces on, that'll protect the knee and reduce that risk of, of, of acute injury. But once again, very expensive and not commonly used at the youth level. Beyond equipment, this is probably the most important thing here. There's a large concentration of injuries that you see at the beginning of any season. And that's common sense. You have athletes that aren't in their prime condition. They've maybe been lounging around. Maybe they're new to the sport altogether. 
Maybe they're trying it for the first time, and they're going from zero to, to 100 miles an hour very quickly, uh, ramping up, and they get injured. So the key here is to have proper training and warm up in the preseason and have proper conditioning, and often even to have some conditioning before the preseason so that the athlete's ready for practice on that first day. It doesn't have to be a, an intense exercise. It shouldn't be a contact exercise. It shouldn't be the kind of thing that's going to wear the player out, but you can get the body ready so it's primed for a good season. Now, just like we had the issues with football, and we noticed the, the problems with uh, cervical spine injuries there, in soccer, we've noticed that there's an epidemic, if you will, of ACL injuries. It's particularly common in females, unfortunately. ACL is an a ligament in the knee, and it can tear. And what we're trying to do is find ways to minimize this. Now, I'm not going to focus too much on this because our next lecturer, Michael Armandi, is going to be focusing on this, and I, I want to let him speak uh, at length on it. But these sorts of programs do exist, but they're difficult. They are time-intensive workout regimens. They usually take about 20, 30 minutes or so at the beginning of a practice. You need someone very well-educated to teach these programs to the team. You have to keep doing them, and you need appropriate oversight during them. And still scientifically, it's unclear exactly to what degree they reduce ACL injuries, although it does appear that they do reduce overall knee injury rates and probably do also reduce ACL injury rates. Now, I couldn't help but put my hometown, our hometown hero up here. This is Heather O'Reilly. I said I came from a soccer town. Heather's my friend's little sister. She's also you know, one of our U.S. national women's soccer players. She's, uh, she's done very well on our U.S. soccer team. And whenever I'm doing a lecture and I, I talk about soccer, I can't help but put a picture of Heather in there. Because I remember her as a little kid in, the, in the, uh, the child's car seat in the back of our car going to soccer practice. And she certainly, certainly did well. So this is just to illustrate how complicated some of these ACL prevention programs are. You can see, we can't just print this paper out, hand it to some coach and say, here, please do this. This is very detailed. There's a technique to each of these exercises. I don't expect that you'd be able to read these words. I just wanted you all to see how complicated it was. So what's next? What's, what's on the horizon in terms of this effort to, to search out and help with acute sports injuries issues in, sp in, in sports? Well, possibly it's cheerleading. Believe it or not, uh, cheerleading can be a very dangerous sport, especially at the collegiate level, but probably also at the high school level where we're doing the stunting and the throws. Now, in terms of tracking injuries, sometimes it's difficult to track who exactly is hurt. But one of the things that's easy to track if you're trying to get data is what money is spent. And the NCAA has a pool of money that's available to treat the athletes in the various sports. And when they follow the money spent, it's an indicator of where the injuries are occurring. And a quarter of the dollars for all the sports in NCAA sports is spent on cheerleading injuries. That seems pretty high, but you might say, well, I bet football is even higher. I bet cheerleading is not too bad. Well, you'd be right. Football is higher. It's 37% of the, of the dollars uh, spent on NC, uh, of all NCAA athlete injuries. But football has 10 times the participation rate of cheerleading. So if you compare per athlete, cheerleading has 6.7 times the rate of uh, expenditures on sports injuries compared to football, and therefore we would assume 6.7 times the injury rate. Now you can imagine how this might be the case. These people are going high in the air. They're relying on their teammates to catch them. It's an imperfect a scenario, and maybe there's something that can be done in the future to make this safer for our, our cheerleading athletes. So now we're going to talk about overuse injuries, and this is really the meat of the talk, because this is where a lot of the epidemic is coming in. This is where the issue with single sport specialization has an influence. We're doing the same sport over and over again. Now an overuse injury, like I said, it's a little hazy. It doesn't occur at a specific moment. It's kind of nagging, and it just builds up over time. When I see someone in my office and they're going to have an overuse injury, when I ask them, what's the problem? They'll, they'll start by moving their hands. They won't know how to describe it. They'll say it kind of is achy somewhere. I'll ask them where. They won't really be able to point with one finger. It'll be a vague general area. I'll say, okay, well, when did it start? They won't really have a clear answer on that. They won't say it was in the third quarter of this game. They're going to say, you know, I don't know. About three months ago, I started having a little pain, but it kind of got better and I thought it was gone. And then it came back, and it got a little worse. But then I went on vacation for a week, and I stopped playing, and it got better. So I thought it was gone. But then vacation ended, and then it came back again. And I didn't even want to report it to my coach because it wasn't that bad, and I didn't want to report it to my parents. But my grandma noticed I was limping, and, and she told me to come to the doctor. These are the stories you, you seem to get. And some examples of what these overuse injuries are are things like shin splints, 
tennis elbow, but also serious things like stress fractures, tendonitis, and some of the stretching and tearing of the elbow ligaments in pitchers that you hear about where players are needing this sort of Tommy John surgery, oftentimes at younger levels, younger ages than, than in the past. And the issue here is that the body needs rest to recover, and we can't do the same action over and over and over again. We're not designed that way. We have a healing capacity, but we need the opportunity to heal. And that's going to be the next, next issue we're talking about here. So this concept of overuse, we can use a paper clip as an example. If I handed out paper clips here, and I said to everyone, I'm going to give you five seconds to break this paper clip, we probably wouldn't have much success. But if I said you have a minute, break the paper clip however you'd like, we'd all have no problem. We'd just bend the paper clip back and forth, and eventually it would just fall apart. One of those, it would just fatigue. It would fall apart. And that's what's happening to our bodies in these overuse injuries. But our bodies have an advantage the paper clip doesn't. Our bodies have the capacity to heal themselves. It's magical, but we have to allow it to do its job. So this graph here is going to summarize how to use the body appropriately and let it heal versus how not to. And we're going to start by looking at a paper clip. Going up here is basically stress, stress on the body, or in this case, the paper clip. And here is time. So as we go forward in time, we're going over here. If the stress goes over this yellow line here, that's when we have an injury. That's when the paper clip breaks. That's when the bone breaks, stress fracture. That's when we have a lot of pain, whatever it is. The paper clip, you start bending and it starts to be stressed. You give it a rest, it doesn't recover because it's a paper clip. You bend it some more, it's getting close. Give it a rest, it doesn't improve. You bend it some more, eventually it breaks. If we have a healthy relationship with sports and enough time off in any given week and enough time off in, in any given year, you can look at this as a graph of a week's activity, week by week, or season by season. You ramp up, you're playing hard, but then you have some downtime either on the weekend, a couple days during the week you're off, or the off season for a whole season. Then you do it again next week or next season and you rest. Same thing. And you're never getting any closer here. You're well within the safe range. The problem we run into with these overuse injuries is we get on this red line. We ramp it up. We have a little bit of rest, but it's not enough. But we ramp it up just as much again. And we rest, but once again, not enough. And you see what's happening. Eventually we're creeping up here and we start to have a little ache and it goes away and it doesn't and we keep going and eventually the body fails. And that's what we want to avoid. Now when I say we need rest, it doesn't mean you sit on the couch and watch TV and not exercise. It means we do something different. The body needs rest from its specific activity that's been doing over and over and over again in your sport and you can do something else instead. Pro athletes know this. They're worth millions of dollars and they can't break down and that's why they have off seasons. And in the off season, they do different things. Some football players like Steve McClendon, they'll do ballet in the off season. It sounds funny, but it's great for footwork, great for flexibility, and he's not going to stress his body the same way doing ballet that he is playing football. So it's a healthy way for him to actually improve his performance on the off season, but also let his body rest. And Jonas Cespedes on the Mets, turns out he's a great golfer. He's just great at everything. He's a great athlete. So when he's not playing baseball, giving his body a rest, he'll play some golf, keep his hand-eye coordination up, but he's going to stress his body in a different way than he will in baseball. It's a relative rest. So we can still work on things and even improve our physical capacity without stressing our body. So, are children more predisposed to overuse injury? The answer, obviously, is yes. That's why we're having this talk. And why is this? Well, children are not just small adults. They're different. They're different in a couple different ways. One of them is that, of course, children have less strength and different mechanics. And if you ask them to do a certain task, they're going to do it differently than an adult would. That's just the biomechanical facts of it. The bodies are different, they're different size, and they're going to figure out the best way for their body to do it, which is different than the best way for an adult's body to do it. And sometimes what that leads to is a situation where they're overusing part of their body because they don't have the strength in the, the core, they don't have the strength in the legs. They're going to force their upper body to maybe work too hard, whereas an adult wouldn't have to do that. And we see that sometimes in pitching a baseball, we also see it in, in actually ice skating. They ice skate differently. The other issue, which is the main thing, is that children have growth plates. That's how you guys grow. We have kids here. The reason you guys grow is your skeleton grows and the rest of your body catches up. All your muscles and tendons, they all stretch to, to meet your skeleton. Your skin stretches along with it. The way your skeleton grows is because you have parts of your bone that aren't calcified yet. See these black lines all here? Those aren't abnormal. Those are normal. Those are fine. Those are growth plates. They're parts of the bone 
that haven't turned to calcium yet. And they're cartilaginous. They're made of cartilage and they're growing. But what that also means is they're not as strong as the calcified bone. It's weaker. And if we put too much stress in this system, it's the area where it's going to fail. And it's going to break. So here's an analogy, all right? I'm sure we'd all love to be on this hammock right now, right? It's a nice, strong hammock on a beautiful beach. And it's, you can sit on it all day long. It's not going to have a problem. You pile four of your friends in it. It's not going anywhere. It's got nice, strong rope connected appropriately here. These trees aren't going anywhere. Nice, strong system. This represents the adult skeleton, which, of course, can fail if you put enough weight on it, but it's pretty strong. This is the child skeleton with the growth plate. Imagine some crazy guy inserted a rubber band, really strong one, strong rubber band, between the wood and the, the twine holding the, the hammock to the tree. Eventually, it might fail. Initially, it would hold you, but if more and more weight is put on it for a long and long enough duration, it's going to stretch and eventually it's going to break. And that's what's happened to our, our, our child skeleton. It has a rubber band called the growth plate, made of cartilage, essentially put into an otherwise strong system, and that can break. So this is another topic I'm only going to touch on briefly, because Michael's going to go over it in greater detail. But the thrower's elbow, the thrower's shoulder, pitchers, that's an area where we really first got a glimpse of the risk of overuse injuries in youth athletics. We also see it in adult athletics. But in youth athletics, it's particularly the case. What we found is that if you want to prevent injury, you have to limit the number of pitches that athletes pitch based on their ages. And based on the number of pitches they pitch, that dictates how much rest they need. And if you go beyond this, you increase the risk of injury. For example, pitchers who pitch consistently with a fatigued arm had an injury that required surgery 36 times more likely than those who didn't. 36 times, that's remarkably high. That's remarkably high. And for young kids, 9 to 14, who pitched over 100 innings a year, there was a 3.5 times risk of injury that was bad enough to make them miss competition when compared to kids who didn't pitch that much. So we're getting into the theme here of maybe there's a threshold we need to stay under to stay safe, and actually that's a good investment because we want to avoid this. We want to avoid missed competition. We want to avoid a surgery. You don't recover from those things quickly. That's a big loss of time. So if we're trying to minimize our time lost, sometimes the way to do it is to take some time off and let the body rest. That's pitch count. They also believe that there's some relation between the types of pitches kids should be throwing and the ages at which they can throw it. And this is not definitively proven in science. It's suspected by pretty much every expert in the area, but it hasn't been proven definitively. But the belief is that these breaking pitches, like curveballs, knuckleballs, and sliders and screwballs, you should be old enough to shave before you start throwing those. Usually that's at about 14 years old. But anyone who's had kids here knows that one 14-year-old doesn't necessarily look like another 14-year-old. People mature at different rates. So just saying that someone hit their birthday, that's not the best way to really assess this. What's more important is where are their growth plates at this point? How mature is their body? And we can use, in a, in a male, of course, uh, uh, shaving as, as an in indicator for that. Now, why are we so interested in, in throwing and pitching injuries? This shows it right here. So this is Monet Davis. She's the first female, first girl ever to pitch uh, and get a win in a Little League World Series, and she actually also pitched a shutout. She had a 70-mile-an-hour fastball when she was 14. All right, so I'm glad I wasn't playing against her. That's pretty fast. And you can see here, this is how she gets all that speed. The arm is way back. The, the baseball is almost, almost flat to the ground. The arm is, uh, forms way back. They're almost parallel to the ground. And you can imagine the forces across this elbow. It's just springing open the inner side of the elbow, and then it's going to spring back, and that's going to throw the ball forward. And that works great until it doesn't. And that's why we have to be careful. Enter little league elbow. Little league elbow is what can happen when it doesn't go well. And that's what we want to avoid. One of the things we want to avoid, and that's why we have these pitch counts and these, these restrictions on our young pitchers. So let's start down here. You guys remember the picture of the hammock with the crazy rubber band put in it? Well, here's our rubber band. Here's a nice strong tree, the string, the hammock, but somehow there's a rubber band here, and that's what's going to fail. That rubber band is the growth plate over on the inner side of the elbow. And that's where this Tommy John surgery ligament, called the ulnar collateral ligament, this is a ligament we always hear about. One of our baseball players has reconstructive surgery on their elbow, and then they're out for a year or more as they rehab. That's when this ligament breaks. In a child, oftentimes the failure doesn't occur here, but it occurs over there. 
and we start to see widening, the growth plate gets too wide, it's essentially a fracture happening there. And if this goes uh, on far enough, we can actually see it, it pull completely off, and then that requires surgical treatment, and we, that's obviously one of the things we want to avoid. Even at this level, the patient's going to need a lot of rest to let that heal up and secure itself so it doesn't keep hurting and so it's not at risk of coming off. And as children do get older and these growth plates start to heal down, then we start to see actually issues with the ligament itself more in kids. It's a chronic repetitive traction injury because it's being pulled on. And this, although we're showing it to you in the elbow, it occurs in various forms throughout the body. It can occur in the knee, in the kneecap, in the heel, and in the foot in similar setups here where you have a growth plate right near where there's an attachment of some soft tissues. So that's little league elbow. Of course, there should be little league shoulder. It wouldn't be a complete set without it. So little league shoulder is going to be an issue at the growth plate at the top of the humerus or the arm bone. And it's the same thing. We're going to have a repetitive stress injury there. And it's common from age 11 through the early teens. But once you get to about 17 or 18, you should be through with it because the growth plate closes and it's solid calcified bone then. Now, if you think back to Monet Davis' delivery or this young man's delivery, you can imagine that there's almost a twisting going on in the bone here. It's a torsion, all right? The arm is back and it's stuck here, but this wants to go farther and it's being twisted. And that stress is going to concentrate at the weak point in that bone, which is that growth plate on top, all right? Now, once this actually occurs and they have the little league shoulder and the growth plate starts to widen, it's not a quick fix. We wish there was. We want to get players back quickly, but usually it's about three months of rest. That's a whole season. That's, that's the playoff that the, that the player was working toward. It's, it's time they don't want to miss. And if we had perhaps, in a, in a certain case, been a little bit more judicious in terms of how much throwing we allowed, how much rest we mandated, then we wouldn't have had that tragedy where the player has to, is injured and then has to miss the important part of the season they were really looking forward to. And just to show you that this is a real thing, this is a patient's normal shoulder. I don't know if you can make out the little black line here, but that's a normal growth plate. And then there's the shoulder they throw with, which was aching. And you can see how wide this is here. It's really gapped open. The bone's really coming apart. So our theme here is, although everyone likes to be tough, and there's certainly nothing wrong with working your hardest and running even though you're out of breath and trying to get really you know, good exercise and workout in, if a youngster or any athlete for that matter is actually having pain, we don't want to work through it. No pain, no gain doesn't work here. There's no place for it in youth sports and really in my mind sports at all. If the body itself is hurting, I'm not talking about feeling winded, I'm talking about really hurting, that's telling you, it's pleading with you for a rest. Give it the rest it needs before it gets uh, to be too much because if you just brush it under the rug and pretend it's not happening, it doesn't go away. It's just going to get worse and eventually more time off is going to be needed than if it was addressed early on. I told you I love this graph, and this is what we want to avoid. If we're getting signals, just listen to them early, shut things down for a shorter amount of time, let the body recuperate. Now, we've talked a lot about baseball, but this is not limited to baseball. It applies to all sports, all right? Sometimes the types of injuries you get in a certain sport are unique. You won't get it in a different sport, and we're starting to understand this better. In ice hockey, oftentimes players will start very young and they'll play all throughout their career and they'll eventually make it perhaps into the NHL or something like that. They have this long hockey career. But there's a condition that's become very prevalent in hockey players we're noticing now called hip impingement. The hip is a ball and socket joint. And to work properly, the hip has to bend up and not bump into the socket. You need this little carve out area here, okay? So you can bend the hip up and not have it hit. The other word for hit is impinge, okay? When it is hitting, that's called hip impingement. And when we have that contact forming, what happens is the body responds to that stress, unfortunately in this case, by laying down more bone and having less of a carve out here and leading to just more impingement. And once that happens, you start crunching the cartilage on the edge of the cup called the labrum, and people get labral tears and hip pain and the like. And that's something that sometimes requires surgery. So we're starting to realize that perhaps there are certain ways that youngsters are skating that might be putting them in a risky position for impinging and then laying down this new bone. And there are questions going on now in hockey as to how we should teach skating and whether there are certain ways that we should focus on that will be safer for our athlete. 
The other part of hockey that can be troublesome is the hockey goalie that goes into this butterfly position. It just so happens that's the position that tends to push the ball up into the socket and impinge. Gymnastics is another sport that we tend to see uh, sometimes represented in overuse injuries. It's not surprising. We talked about one of the hallmarks of avoiding overuse injuries being an off-season. Well, as an indoor sport, gymnastics is year-round. Even in doom and gloom New Jersey, where I grew up, it doesn't matter if it's 20 degrees outside and snowing. You can still put on your parka and go to the gymnastics place and then get changed into your gymnastics uniform. So there's not an opportunity for rest oftentimes. For the female gymnast, it's also a very high impact activity for the upper extremities. The males also, but a little bit more so for the female gymnast, just the way the, the events are. So our arms aren't really meant for load bearing. We're bipeds. You know, humans start, stopped walking on all fours well before we were called humans, way back when. So our arms aren't really meant for the load that our legs are. And so because of that, the gymnastics maneuvers sometimes will lead to these overuse injuries in the upper extremities, specifically the wrist. Also, a lot of gymnastic maneuvers require hyperextension of the back, you know, walkovers, certain uh, you know, flips and routines. When you hyperextend the back over and over again, you can actually get a certain type of stress fracture in the back, and that's something that we always look out for. Interestingly, football linemen are also predisposed to this because when you get to the football line, you put your football down, then you have to pick your head up, and you're arching your back over and over and over again. And these big guys will show up with the same injuries that the young gymnasts are. So it's interesting. The males with different apparatus that you're working on will have more overuse injuries in the shoulder and the elbow. And there's always that question of whether gymnastics causes decreased height or delayed puberty. And it hasn't been proven. We think maybe what's going on is there's a selection where shorter individuals have more success in gymnastics, and maybe that's why we see it. Some studies suggest that maybe there is a bit of a delay, but then gymnasts catch up in their height. But the jury's still out on this. We don't know definitively yes or no what's going on. So here's where the rubber meets the road. What do we do about this? Basically, one of the keys here in terms of preventing overuse injuries is proper nutrition. We talked about the body healing itself. You can't do that if you don't give it any fuel to do so. It needs proper nutrition. And when we don't have proper nutrition and we go to the other end of the spectrum and actually end up getting terribly malnourished through an eating disorder, then we invite a whole host of other problems on. It's important that I, I touch on this. There are certain sports that are associated with higher rates of eating disorders. Now, most of these are in female sports, but it's not limited only to females. Sports that have these higher rates are, are, are running, where a thin body frame is, is advantageous. Also, sports where there's, there could be body image issues, uh, such as gymnastics or swimming, where more of the body is exposed and on view. The problem not only is having the eating disorder itself, but that an eating disorder can lead to abnormal menstruation and disruptions in the hormonal cycle for the young female athlete. And when that happens, the hormonal disruption actually leads to changes in the bone density and weakening of the bones. And if we have someone who's an athlete pounding away at their body, not eating properly, having hormonal abnormalities, and therefore low bone density, you can imagine that we've just created the perfect storm for a stress fracture, all right? And we see this not infrequently in some of our endurance athletes. And it's something we all have to be aware of. So make sure our athletes are getting good nutrition. Of course, if you're running, avoiding hard surfaces is wonderful. And running shoes don't last forever. They're only good for about 500 miles, so make sure your equipment is up to date. We already talked about good technique, and this is the next important point here. We really want to gradually increase activity. We alluded to this about the start of the season, how we don't want to ramp up too quickly when we're first going from off season into the season. Same thing if you're trying to increase your workout. They talk about a pre-puberty 10% rule where you shouldn't increase whatever parameter you're talking about. The weight, the training intensity, the mileage, the pace by more than 10% a week. My personal opinion is that this doesn't just apply to people who are prepubescent. This applies to me. This applies to adults too. This is a great, great rule and I tell all my patients that are coming off of a surgery or an injury to essentially abide by it. Ramp up slowly, give the body time to rest and accommodate because it, it can accommodate as long as we give it a chance. It's not an instantaneous thing. We need to give it a little bit of time. And back to that concept before, go into your season a little bit toned up as well, all right? Get some conditioning in the off season. So that's the what. Now we're gonna flip over from orthopedics and talk a little bit more 
about sociology, economics, and the like. So how did we get here? Why are our youth athletes practicing like the Cherry Hill soccer team now? Why is everything so intense? Why, why are we having all these injuries, perhaps as a consequence of that? Well, I don't have all the answers, but there's probably some element of societal pressure. I remember when I was a kid, it was really fun to identify yourself as an athlete. It, it, it's, it's a pride thing, it, it's enjoyable. Everyone wants to think of themselves as, as elite when it comes to athletics, and you know that continues, and that can be the defining component of a young person uh, you know, at that age. You also, as they get older, start to think about the costs of college. Now, I almost passed out when I looked up these numbers, because I have four kids, and I saw what it actually cost to go to Stanford for a year. So basically, a four-year degree at Stanford, all costs included tuition, room board books, is over a quarter of a million dollars. All right? That's an awfully large sum of money. All right? And if someone has a youngster who's a high-level athlete, and they think they can actually play in college, perhaps, that's an appealing, appealing route. You can perhaps get into an even better school than one would get into just based on academics if you have athletic potential there and are recruited, and you might go for free. And that's a heck of a cost savings. That's, that's, that's a huge cost savings. So it's not surprising that people will go down that road. And I'm not saying we shouldn't, but it's important that we recognize the numbers involved. If you look at all the high school athletes, less than one-tenth of one percent will get a college scholarship. That's less than one in a thousand. Okay? So it's a basket. It's just not one we want to put all of our eggs in. When we look at the NFL, a lot of our young football players want to play in the NFL. The numbers, not surprisingly, are even a little bit longer. The odds of a high school football player making it to the NFL on the roster in any way, we're not talking about being a star, we're talking about being a reserve player that's on the bench and maybe getting very limited time in games is 6,000 to one. All right? Now, because of the money involved in education, because of the way society is, there's a lot of pressure on coaches to produce athletes that can perform and pr play well in showcases and be at all the right places and get exposed to all the, the, the recruiters and the coaches and the scouts. There's also pressure on parents. I'm a parent. There's a pressure on parents to do the right thing for their kids. You don't want to miss an opportunity for them. You don't want to fail to get them you know, on the right team with the right exposure and the right coach, and these are all legitimate concerns. And it's just a question of how to balance that with all the information we just talked about, how, how to walk that fine line to get the child the opportunities but not push them too far to where their body starts to fail and they can't succeed in the end as a result of that. And it's not just pressure on the coaches and parents. In some cases, thankfully not most, the pressure can be from the parents and the coaches, and that's something we always have to be sensitive to. So when we take a step back and think about society, where we got here, I don't know how many of you were able to read this book, but it's excellent. This is a book called Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. He's a Canadian economist. I actually just saw him give a lecture about a month or two ago, a very smart man. It's an excellent book. And basically this book tries to break down success and how we get success. And one of the theories that gets advanced by Malcolm Gladwell in this book is the 10,000 hour rule. That might sound familiar to some of you. And it's this concept that to really succeed at a highly technical activity. It requires 10,000 hours of appropriate, dedicated practice before you gain mastery. And he cites examples from music, such as the Beatles. The Beatles practiced incessantly. They, they worked actually a lot in Germany before they made it big uh, in the UK. They were not just an accidental success. They were very, very, very well-trained musicians. Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist, he didn't just pick up a cello and get Get, get into our lecture here today. He worked very hard to do that. And in some sports, the 10,000 hours rule probably does apply, and you have to start at a young age. In gymnastics and figure skating, that appears to be the case. It may not be the case in all sports, but he may be onto something in some cases. When we look at super elite gymnasts, these are the all-around female gymnastics gold medalists, starting from Nadia on. And you can see the ages here. You can't really just casually pick up gymnastics when you're 14, 15 years old and try to make it to this level. People have already won gold medals and gone home by that age. Unfortunately, that's the reality of the sport, that we have to start early. In a sport like this, it's highly technical, so we can be good by the very early age that someone reaches their female gymnastic prime. Okay? So that kind of runs counter to what some of the other things we're saying, but I have to acknowledge what the situation is there. 
Now, does this apply to all sports? Here I'm going to say the answer is no. It doesn't apply to most sports. When we talk about early sports specialization, getting rid of all your other sports and just focusing on one, and doing that before the age of 12 years, when we look at elite Russian swimmers, the swimmers that specialized before age 11 spent less time on the national team and retired earlier. Why is this? Well, there are two ideas that come to my mind. One is probably psychological burnout. It's not easy. It's not easy to play the same sport over and over again. People burn out, and you know, if it's just the, the earlier you start focusing on it, the earlier one might burn out. The other is physical burnout. That's the overuse injury we're talking about. Chronic shoulder pain in swimmers, instability, things of that nature. All right? In tennis, we saw a similar pattern. The elite athletes were more likely to specialize after 13 years than before 11 years. And in the best study of over 1,500 German Olympic athletes, the truly elite ones began intense training later and played more than one sport after age 11. Okay? So the way to really get elite is perhaps to hold on to some other sports, to balance your athletic activity, cross-chain between different athletic endeavors, and hopefully this will allow you to survive childhood to survive the athletics of childhood and succeed in high school and college and into adulthood. All right? Now, ultimately, you have to specialize. By age 21, the elite athletes accumulated more hours, but it wasn't the case at their very young ages. And of course, the question is, what's the shade of gray? How much is enough? How much is too much? When do we turn on the training? When do we specialize? When do we drop a sport? There's not going to be one answer. It's different for every athlete. It's different for every sport. It's different in every case. But I just want to make sure that we understand that this is a question in our mind, and the answer isn't always focus on one sport as early as possible and play it as much as possible. That's not always the answer. And in many cases, I think it's, it's probably not the answer for all the reasons we discussed. And as a youth soccer coach, I couldn't help but, but end here as we're talking about healthy influences on our children, kind of a message to the parents and coaches I'm coaching eight-year-old little girl soccer, and I'm telling you, every now and again, you have someone who's getting a little too worked up on the sideline. We just have to remember our context here, that we want to teach good sportsmanship, and that these are youngsters, and that even when it gets competitive for youngsters, we still want to make sure we model appropriately. And the last thing we ever want to do is start living vicariously through the child. We want to let the child find their own path. We want to encourage them. We want to facilitate but we don't want to overly, overly drive them, either because you know, we want to be successful in sports through them, or we were successful in sports and we want them to emulate us. So, Heather, one more time, because I'm a big fan. The take-home points here, basically. Don't play through pain. Let's listen to our bodies, especially when it comes to a kid, because they're different than adults. They have open growth plates. Their bodies are just simply more fragile. That's the fact of the matter. We talked about those curves with the, that, I, that I drew out with the, the white lines for the paper clip, the green line for the person training appropriately, and the red line for the person who wasn't training appropriately. Let's make sure we stay on that green line. Schedule a rest month or two every year so you can, you can recover, let that body cool down. That's the long term. And then the short term, make sure you're not going every day of the week. Have enough short term rest in the weekly schedule that the body has a chance to recuperate on that short term scale and embrace the concept of the multi-sport youth athlete. Don't think that someone that's doing multiple sports is doing the wrong thing. Maybe that's the right thing, and maybe it's the safe thing. It's certainly not a problem. And parents and coaches, our youngsters look to us, and we need, we need all the adults on board for this healthy athletic program. So thank you very, very much. So Dr. Noor touched on a lot of different sports and a lot of different areas of where you may be getting injured, but today I'll be focusing on preventing injuries in youth athletes for shoulders and knees. So when you're moving around, you saw that your shoulders have a lot of range of motion. It consists of your humerus, your clavicle, and your shoulder blade. And with all that movement, the shoulder lacks stability. And so what you want to think about is a golf ball on a golf tee, a big surface trying to rest on a smaller surface. So to help with stability, you have the rotator cuff, which consists of a series of muscles. It has your supraspinatus, infraspinatus, the uh, subscapularis, and the teres minor. All this helps to surround the, the humerus in its place to prevent it from losing its stability. 
Also along with the shoulder you have the bursa, which is located usually all along under the bone and muscle to allow for smoother movement of the shoulder. And you also have the labrum that comes off the shoulder blade itself to allow for more of an enclosed environment for the humerus. Common injuries you'll find in the rotator cuff are, or in the shoulder are rotator cuff tears, tears of the muscles in the shoulder as well as the tendons themselves. Shoulder impingement, which is having the part of the shoulder blade actually pushing up against the tendons of the rotator cuff, causing irritation. Shoulder dislocation, which is an actual separation of the humerus, your, the bone in your arm, from the actual shoulder itself. We have tendonitis, which is inflammation of the tendons of the rotator cuff, usually associated with the shoulder impingement. You have shoulder bursitis, which is the inflammation of the bursa that allows for that smooth movement of the shoulder and a labral tear, having a tear in the labrum from either some sort of traumatic acute injury or an overuse injury. So understanding the movement of the shoulder, any sort of movements, you have kinematics and kinetics. Kinematics is more of the how of the motion where the kinetics is the why. So when you think of kinematics, you're thinking of a thrower, the motion of them, you see them throwing their arm back, the external rotation, the throwing coming across the body and having the follow through, that's the how. The why is the rotator cuff, making sure that the shoulder isn't going too far back out and also allowing the, muscle, the arm to decelerate accordingly, appropriately, doing the follow through of a throw. And you wanna think, cause there's a lot of movement, and a lot of torque going on at the shoulder and at the elbow. Think of the biceps and how fast it's moving. It's going at 2000 degrees per second in extension during the follow through to prevent too much of that movement when the humerus is going at 7,000 degrees per second. Here's Timmy. Look at all the how. When you look at this picture, think about all of this. This is the how, the kinematics, him throwing his leg out, extension, throwing his arm back into external rotation. Now think of the why, the kinetics part behind it. How much flexibility he's gonna need in his hip to get that range. All, of the, all the rotator cuff, all the muscles working to make sure that this isn't going too far back and when he follows through, making sure it doesn't go too far forward. So risk factors for injuries of the shoulder are year-round participation in one sport, like Dr. Nord was saying, you kinda wanna mix it up a little bit. Muscular imbalances, having some muscles too tight while other muscles are too shortened and weak can cause further injury of the shoulder. And sometimes these, these the speed of these pitches that are being thrown can be upwards of 80 miles per hour and having that constantly being overused is an issue and can cause risk to the shoulder. You also have early breaking balls, the, the old enough to shave throwing pitches that Dr. Norda talked about, the screw balls, curve balls, all those breaking pitches add a little bit more torque to the shoulder and the elbow. Talk about general overuse, pitching too much without a break in between causes issues and improper warm up before games and even in the beginning of the season can cause issues. Year round participation. It was 80 degrees, almost 90 degrees today. California has beautiful weather, which allows for more days to allow to play, allow to practice. And so with that, you can be able to, tr with travel ball, when you have a, tr a team that's traveling year round, you can play more. And with this, you don't, athletes don't want to fall behind others. If, they, if you have a friend that's on the travel team and they're going to think that they're going to be better than they are, and so there's a lot of pressure for them to be part of that traveling team because if you're on a team, you're playing more, more exposure to college recruiters and potential scholarships. But even though, as Dr. Norder pointed out, that sometimes that number of the, those athletes getting a scholarship are very slim. So they think more exposure is gonna help them get that scholarship. So this is what Dr. Norder had touched on before earlier on from seven to eight Take a look at the daily pitches right here on the side. At seven to eight, you wanna throw at most 50 pitches in a game. 50, that's about it. And then you're gonna, every two years, they increase about 15 to 10 pitches to win. When you're 17, 18 years old, you're pitching at about 105 pitches in a day. So if you start, the biggest thing you wanna do is, when you get to about 105, you wanna rest four days. Allow the rest in the shoulder so you're not overusing it and reducing and increasing those risks of injury. If you notice at age 15, 
you're allowed to throw a little bit more before you having to do your zero to four day rest in between. So going into general overuse, you don't want to be pitching too much. Just as going back to that graph right here, that's a lot of pitches. You don't want to go beyond that with your athletes. And if you are a pitcher, you don't want to be playing catcher as well. If you're being taken off on the pitcher's mound, you don't want to switch and play the catcher because you're going to be throwing back to the pitcher and you're constantly going back and forth using that arm. And even though you're not throwing at as much of a velocity, you're still using that arm continuously going back and forth with the, uh, the pitcher. And then going back again with the breaking balls, it's a big controversy because now with Little League, the game is so competitive, you want to have that edge. So you want to have those, those curve balls, those sliders, all those different pitches to throw off the, the batters when they play. But throwing too young, too fast, with those growth plates still growing could cause a, a little bit of a increased risk with these athletes. But there's some studies that show that there's no increase in risk with breaking balls. It's just that the athletes are more fatigued as they are making these pitches as if doing 105 pitches in a day and doing more of those breaking balls has a high risk of fatigue in these athletes. Dr. James Andrews again, when to start throwing breaking balls, well, once an athlete's 14 years old and they've mastered the fastball and the changeup, that would be a good time to start introducing the curveball or some of these other breaking balls for, for pitchers at that time. This is another way of looking at it. Instead of saying pitches, you could do innings. So if at age eight or younger, you could play about 60 innings in a year, and then nine to 12, 80, 13 to 18, 100 innings in a year. But here's the big thing, rest. You gotta, gotta have that rest. Four months of rest, if you're playing two to three months continuously, allows the tissues to heal up adequately in order to be a little bit healthier for the next season. And like Dr. Nord was saying, you don't have to be doing nothing. Don't be a couch potato between these four months of rest. You could be playing other sports. It's just rest from that one sport. So what can parents and coaches do? Proper education, coming to something like this or being educated on proper form, appropriate pitching along in that, that next point, proper stretching and warm up before an event, before practice, and then parents not putting as much pressure on the athletes, not living vicariously through your child as you're doing these activities. So when it comes to strengthening for athletes with throwers and, and other athletes, you want to work on your core and you want to work on your leg strength. When you're throwing, it's not necessarily just your upper body. You're pushing through your feet, translating it through your core and through the arms themselves. So you want to be able to strengthen the core and your legs and especially during the preseason, you want to start early on. You don't want to wait until midseason, start really working on leg exercises and core exercises. You want to start when, bef before the season starts to get them going. So when you talk about balancing out strength, the whole body is about balance. You don't want to have tight musculature and then weak musculature to, to oppose that. You want to make sure you're properly stretching and you want to make sure that so in regards to chest versus back throws, you don't want to have a tight chest because then you won't be able to open up to get your range of motion with the throws. Stretching out appropriately and strengthening the legs are very important when it comes to your throwers. Let's just say an athlete is having sore biceps and triceps. That's a result of not enough functional strength in the arm as the demands of the throwing increase. So it's your failure to utilize your legs and your core when you're throwing, not allowing yourself to really get that range and that extension and you're using too much of the arms to get the throw, get the speed that you want. Same thing with the shoulder. If you're having soreness in the shoulder, that's due to poor body mechanics. And that's either by throwing the ball too early, releasing it when the, your elbow's behind your head and you're not following through appropriately with your throws. The same said with your elbow, again, poor throwing mechanics with weak functional strength in the wrist and forearms. If you have too much with those breaking balls, snapping of the wrist on the breaking pitch, and then dragging your arm out to the side, putting that valgus force on the inside of the elbow, causing that too much of that strain on the inside of your arm. So switching it up now to the knee. So we're going to go through a, how to prevent any ACL type injuries and 
athletes of um, playing soccer, any sort of jumping activities. So we have the knee joint, which is a uniplanar type of motion. It, it extends, it strains, and it bends the knee. As you can see, there's a lot, there's the, there's the tibia, the fibula, uh, the femur, and the patella. There's a lot of muscles, a lot of big, strong muscles, and a lot of ligaments that hold the knee joint together. Looking at this picture here, you have your ACL and your PCL. What these do is they help to prevent any forward and backward translation of your tibia and your femur on the, on the top of each other, while your MCL over here and your LCL prevent any lateral type of movement of these bones together. This is just a general picture of the muscles of your legs. Nice, big, strong muscles help to keep the knee joint secure, but it's important to make sure that these are strong throughout the entire season of play to ensure you have that strong stability in the knee. Common injuries for the knee, if you're having anterior pain in the front of the knee, it could be due to an ACL sprain or tear. You have patellar tendonitis, it's a jumper's knee. Usually when athletes land, if they land improperly with their knees buckled in, this can cause a little bit of pain in the front of the knees. Posterior knee pain could be a hamstring strain or tear. Medial knee pain, M MCL sprain tear, and then lateral knee pain could be an LCL sprain or tear. Risk factors for knees, much like risk factors for the shoulder. Overuse and fatigue. If your athletes are getting too tired because they're playing for too long, then they're going to have a little bit more of instability in the knee, and so they're going to try to rely on their ligaments rather than the muscles for that stability. If there's an external force to the knee, if an athlete falls, slips, comes and comes in contact with your knee, that could cause an excessive stress on those ligaments themselves. Poor body mechanics when you're landing, and again, those muscular imbalances. If some musculatures are tight, if your hamstrings are tight and your quadriceps are weak, that increases the risk of an ACL injury. Here's a picture illustrating an ACL injury. What this person's doing is their knees collapsing in and their body is turning out, and that's putting a lot of torque on the ACL, therefore re increasing the risk of that tear because it's being sheared as it's turning. To prevent any injury in the ACL, you want to start early on, as we said before, preseason conditioning, getting your athletes stronger early on, making sure that they're able to withstand the demands of the season. And when it comes to jumping and landing, you want to make sure that they're not landing hard, that they're landing soft, and you want to make sure that when they land, that their knees aren't buckling in, and that their legs are straight when they're doing these exercises. Don't go too far too fast. You want to make sure that you slowly progress them, get them warmed up early on in the season. Then when things start to really ramp up, that's when things start to become you know, more of a full go type of activity. Core strength, again, I don't think I've said it enough. You, you want to be able to make sure that your core is strong enough to withstand any of those external forces. And let's just say soccer players, they're going up for a header. They're going to get bumped from another athlete. If their core is weak, they're not going to be able to keep themselves together as well when they land or with basketball players going the same thing, going for a jump ball or a rebound. So you want to make sure that also when you're improving the balance and strengthening of the core, you can make sure that the jumping, twisting, and these getting hit, that's just something that you can work on while you're practicing. Strengthen those legs. There's strength training with just weights. There's also, you could incorporate single leg, double leg activities. That will challenge your core along with challenge your, your legs to make sure that they get stronger as well. And when you're doing leg strength type activities, you can incorporate game simulation with soccer players, with running on the field, jumping, bounding, something along those lines, and even with basketball, with jumping and going for rebounds as well. We'll be demoing dynamic warm-ups. With dynamic warm-ups, it's, you know, you, you incorporate more of the game time activity into warming up and loosening up the muscles of the joints. The FIFA 11 Plus, it, it was that long sheet that Dr. Nord had put up, and it's a lo several exercises. It's a, an eight-minute running warm-up, which incorporates eight minutes of exercises, as well as a two-minute running exercise cool-down as well. Again, they're designed and proven by research to prevent injuries, but this isn't the only 
thing out there, the only set of exercises used to help prevent ACL injuries. It was designed mostly for amateur and recreational players, 14 and up. You perform this before every training session, at least two times a week, and the running portions can be performed before every game. It can replace other warm-up exercises, so you don't have to warm up before you warm up. It's one of those things that you do before the game. And usually within 10 to 12 weeks, depending on how often the, the athlete trains, they should notice improvement in strength and performance after completing the FIFA 11 Plus. So we're going to just demonstrate a few of the exercises today, some of the warm-ups and the strengthening. So we're going to just do a little bit of a scenario. She's going to be my, my athlete, and we're just going to show a few warm-up exercises and do some strengthening as well. So, Carmen, we're going to do some high knees. I'll have you start right here. And then just have your high knee to the table and back. Good. Usually, you'd have them do it for a little bit longer, maybe about 20 feet, not so much confined, close space. Now, Carmen, what I want you to do is I want you to do butt kickers. Right. Okay? So what this is doing is we're working on loosening up the muscles in the legs as well as in the front and the back here. Now, can we do some Frankensteins? Frankensteins. You're going to come up straight and then you're going to bring your arm, I mean your arm and leg up this way. What we're doing is we're dynamically stretching out the hamstrings while you're doing this instead of just doing a static hamstring stretch. Good. Now to get some more of the shoulder type stretches, I want you to do a posterior capsule stretch right here. So what we're doing here, getting a nice stretch over here to make sure that we, when we do a follow through with our throws, we're not getting too much of a pull or tension on this side. Good. Now what we'll do here, let me just grab my box of tools here. So we'll do our external rotation, external rotation exercises. So let's do this here. And just do several times. So right here we're stretching out everything, getting all those ligaments and tendons in the shoulder to warm up a little bit, making sure that your arm is at a 90 degree angle, getting it more simulated to a throwing activity or throwing um, form. Now let's bring it down inside. All the motion is going to be coming from the shoulder, so try to keep your elbow more to 90. There we go. So more repetitions about 20 to 30. Try to drop your shoulder down a little bit. There we go, good. That's okay. It's tight. Good. Next what we'll do is we'll do a pec stretch. This one you may use a foam roller if you have these. They're very useful. Place it down on the ground. So what you want to do is you want to get your, the, your hips on the bottom head and just bring your arms out to the side and you're going to hold it there for a few minutes. She's not really going to hold it for a few minutes here, but just for example, and if you want, you can move your arms up, almost do kind of like a snow angel as you're doing this activity. Good. And this is to open up the chest a little bit. Not, so when you're throwing, you can bring your arm back without feeling like you're getting too much of a strain in the front. Good. Now, to go over some core exercises, let's start off with the plank. So with, no. <laughs> so with the plank, what you'll do is you'll get on your toes and you can get on your elbows. What you want to do, you want to make sure that your shoulder, hips, knee, and ankle are in a nice straight line. You don't want your hips to come up off the ground, but you don't want them to sag either. See, don't do that. Okay. Now what you do, I want you to do a side plank. So the core isn't just your front, it's not just your abs. You have, your core encompasses everything. So what you're going to do is get down on the side, hands, contact points are your elbows and your hands here. And with the FIFA 11 Plus, they like to incorporate bringing your hand or your leg up off the right there. And relax. You do all this for 30 seconds, I'm not going to have Carmen do that right now. <laughs> so next. What we're going to do is single leg balance. 
to get this ball out. So you'd hang on to the ball, and I want you to stand on one leg. Big thing you want to look at with athletes standing on one leg is you don't want to see them bringing their knee inward. You want to work on strengthening the exterior rotators of your hips to make sure you're nice and in line. Usually you can progress by tossing the ball back and forth. Back and forth. As you can see, it's a little bit more dynamic of an exercise, but still works well in regards to balance and strengthening of the leg. Do some squats. So with this, you want your feet about shoulder width apart, and you want to act like you're sitting in a chair. So you want to make a nice square at the bottom, making sure that your knees don't go over your toes. Nice and easy. Let's get a few of them so everyone can see. Good. Good. Then the last dynamic exercise would be a squat jump. So you go down into your squat position, and then you're going to come up as high as you can. Big thing is wanting to make sure that you land on the balls of your feet. Nice soft landing. You don't want a nice hard landing because that's just going to jolt through your ankles, knees, and hips. Landing on the balls of your feet, nice soft landing, you're working out the muscles a little bit more and it's a less of a jarring motion for your legs. See? Good. Those are all the demos that I have for you today. Thank you and that concludes our program. Thank you.